Thank you. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Turning to Mary, the mother of the Lord, and our mother, asking her to intercede for us, to help us to receive everything God wants us to receive on this day of retreat or recollection, let us together pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, when I told you before that I'm happy to be back in Buffalo, I meant it. Um, the last time I tried to come to Buffalo, uh, I didn't make it. It's very rare that I don't make it to an event that I'm scheduled. I've uh, all I've done for 10 years, this year is my 10th anniversary as a priest, the only thing I've ever done is preach. Uh, from the day I was ordained, I was never assigned to a parish, I never did anything else, I'm a preacher. And we knew that that's what I would do long before I was ordained. My superiors knew it. He discerned it in the first 10 minutes <laughs> that he ever met me. And actually, I, I never spoke. I never spoke publicly. Matter of fact, when I was growing up in upstate New York, you know, back in, in the good old days, uh, you, you do know how you, you've arrived, don't you? you? You know that you've arrived when you receive your membership card in AARP. <laughs> I have arrived. In any event, you know, I'm half a century or so old. I'll be 54 in May. And... I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, Hudson, New York, is my hometown. And, um, you know, in those days, Buffalo was further away than it is today. Right? You know, it, because it was a major undertaking. If you, if you took a trip to Buffalo, uh, especially in the winter, you know, you were courageous or crazy, one or the other. Uh, but anyway, you know, I, I grew up in the same kind of a town as many of, many of you did. And I feel comfortable. For some reason now, I have preached all over the place. I've preached in 47 states. It's the only thing I've done. Ten years, day in, day out. Uh, difficult, living out of a suitcase. Um, I have a home, more or less, now that I go in and out of. I don't see it very often. But uh, Buffalo is one of those places, you know, in going so many places, every once in a while one clicks. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because you and I are alike in many basic ways. Um, we grew up the same way. I don't know what it is. The water? I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, the agony of watching the bills season <laughs> after season. You know, you know, whatever it is, you know, all those things kind of uh, make us... I don't know, family. Uh, I've always felt comfortable. Now, I've preached in the Buffalo area before, of course. I've gone to the Carmelite Monastery in Buffalo, did a couple of novenas there. The last time I tried to come, I didn't make it. I ended up in the hospital for several days. That's unusual. I think I've missed four, I think four events in 10 years. Uh, I never missed one because of uh, an airplane, which is amazing to me. Last night was the closest I ever came. It was a terrible day, weather all, we flew through storms, and then um, the airline's problems, they didn't have a crew, and you know, I was gonna offer to fly the plane if I had to. <laughs> I don't know how to fly a plane, but I had to do something. I'm going to give five talks today. We're gonna to have to condense it, put it together. It's a Lenten retreat. All right, Lent starts Wednesday, but hey, you know what? We're coming up to Lent. We'll have a Lenten day of retreat today. I'm going to talk about God's mercy first. It's something close to my heart, mainly because I've received more of it than most people. Why have I received more of it than most people? Because I need more of it than most 
people. Mercy is a very special thing. God is mercy. God is rich in mercy. Our Heavenly Father is rich in mercy, the Bible tells us. In recent times, our Father, through His Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit, revealed about this mystery of mercy to us and to Sister Faustina, saint now, that image of the divine mercy, you've seen it, of Jesus with the rays coming out of his heart. God's name is mercy. He's so very merciful. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, it's good news, for one thing, because we need it. But it also means that we are called to be merciful. Mercy is a two-edged sword. This is very important. This is enormously important. Please listen to this. You've been given much. I have been given much. Much will be required of us. To the man or woman who has been given more, and we, because we have the Catholic faith, we've been given more. To the man or woman who's given more, more will be required. We've been given a lot of mercy. We have to be merciful. Now, how does that translate into daily life? You've got to examine yourself. You know, we're coming into Lent, time for self-examination. Lent is a time of preparation, kind of like Advent, which is also a time of preparation. Lent is that time where you take a serious look at yourself, and this is important, be honest. One of the talks I'm going to give today is on humility, which is absolutely essential for salvation, absolutely essential for that holiness of life which helps you to save your soul. No humility, no holiness. Now, part of humility, or really the essence of humility, is to acknowledge the truth. What you need to do is be honest and objective. Reality check. You look at your soul, you look at yourself honestly. One of the worst curses in history is that Catholics are just as sinful as anybody else. Now, we're human, just like anybody else, sure. But we're called to transcend sin. We're given the power of grace to do that. We have the sacraments to do that. But most people act like a Savior never came, suffered, died, and rose on the third day. Do you know why more people don't come into the Catholic Church? You think it's their fault? You think, oh, well, they're dumb or they're, 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 you know, sinners, this, that. It's our fault. Now, at times when I speak, every now and then, some of you will have a twinge of, I don't want that. You know, I don't like what he said. I understand that. I apologize for any discomfort that I cause you, however, cause it I will. <laughs> Why? You need it, and so do I. Hey, you just got to listen to me for a few hours today. Then, oh, happy day, I'm out of here. I got to listen to me day in and day out. <laughs> God made me a preacher because I need it more than you. You know, a few hours helps you out, you're good people. Me, I'm one of those hard cases. Now, you know, I grew up in an Italian family. And it was that my, the family didn't speak Italian in the house. You know, this was in the day, it's unfortunate, but you know, immigrants, uh, somehow, because people that were already here made them, made them feel that where they came from wasn't good, I think. You know, they felt inferior because they didn't speak the language and so forth and so on. But we didn't speak Italian in the home. I mean, it, my grandparents did a little bit, but they never taught us Italian. But I learned a few words. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
My Uncle Tony used to lovingly refer to me as Chooch. You see, the Italian people here know about that. Jackass. Hard-headed, you know, testadura. You know, just instead of brick for a head. You know, stubborn and so forth. You and I need to hear it. Now, some of what I'm going to say through the course of the day, you'll have resistance to it. That's natural. That's all right. Some of it might even hurt you. You know what happens when you poke somebody in a wounded place with a sharp instrument? It hurts. They jump. We all have wounds. Wounds come from sin. The truth is a two-edged sword. The Bible tells us the word of God is a two-edged sword. That's sharp. It cuts right to the heart. Don't worry about that. Be humble. Be humble. If I say anything that makes you jump, it's okay. I, I'm supposed to do that. That's my job. That's what a mission preacher does. Dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. And so, that's what we do. Lent, make this the best Lent of your life. Okay, it's coming up Wednesday. we got a head start. You know, you're the, I've got eight in a row. You're the first one. It starts Wednesday. Hey, this will be over by then. I hope it can prepare you to make the best Lent, the best preparation for the Paschal Mystery for Easter that you could possibly have. This can change your life. This should change your life. I'm a simpleton. I'm very, very simple. When I finished my doctoral studies, when I received my fifth university degree, I received them all with highest honors. The mentor or director of my doctoral thesis said to me, well, you've come to the end of the line, finally. You've gotten every degree you can possibly get. You just can't get any more formal education. Now, tell me, what is it that you have learned? And I said to him, without even thinking, it just was, came naturally. I said, well, I've learned that I don't know anything. He said, great, you're an educated man. We haven't wasted our time totally with you. Compared to God, that's what we're studying, right? When we study the faith, we're studying God himself. We know so little. It's like the head of a pin. St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian in the history of the church, when he came to the end of his long and illustrious life, he, he said he, all this knowledge that he had, and he had a lot, he said all of it's so much straw. When you come up against the grandeur, the infinite majesty of God, well, it's just a little bit of straw. But it's important. Mercy. If you have all the knowledge in the world, if you have all the power in the world, if you have all the money in the world, and yet you don't make God present through your life, especially through mercy, you're a zero. Remember, when we get out of here, when we die, and, you know, we don't like to talk about You ever notice that in our culture, we don't like to talk about death too much? You know, we don't want to like to hear about that. Padre Pio, blessed Padre Pio, used to remind people, especially uh, rich people, people who were dressed up in fancy clothes and stuff like that. He used to, he was very earthy, and he was very direct. At one time, a uh, a lady came to him, and uh, she wanted to have him say something nice. It was her 70th birthday, and she was dressed up in fancy clothes, unlike the peasant women who used to come to the monastery. And she said, now, now, Father, say something nice to me. It's my 70th birthday. And he leaned over, and he whispered in, in her ear, death is near. <laughs> Soon you will be food for worms. <laughs> A comforting thought. Now the fact of the matter is, we get preoccupied with a million and one things. There's only one thing important, getting to heaven. And don't you forget it. You can make all the money in the world, you can achieve all the worldly power, prestige, you don't get to heaven, you're a zero, you're a failure. The only definitive failure in a human life is the failure to get to heaven, period. 
Now that's very simple. All right. I think you believe that. Now look, if you don't believe that there's a heaven and a hell, you're in big trouble. There are big shot theologians who don't believe in hell, you know. There was a guy on the West Coast who had a doctorate degree in religious education. He formed all the catechists on most of the West Coast. He didn't believe in the existence of hell. He was a, he was a heretic. You know what that word means? Heretic? Okay. You know what heresy is? Heresy is an obstinate post-baptismal denial of some element of faith and morals which must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith or an obstinate doubt concerning saints. He didn't believe what we believe. Now, there are a lot of people today who don't believe what we believe. Now, I don't mind if a Buddhist doesn't believe what we believe. I'd like him to. I'd like him to come to the fullness of truth. Uh, or, or a Baptist or a Presbyterian, they're very close. They believe most of what we believe. But I'm talking about Catholics. We are at war. And our war is not against flesh and blood. The devil is real. One of the first times I ever preached... I was totally unknown, right out of the university. I'd just received my doctorate, and I was invited because somebody knew, hey, he has, he has a doctorate, maybe he knows something, we'll fill in a spot. And there was some well-known liberal theologian there giving a talk, and it went something like this. He said, well, now, you know, we really don't believe in the existence of angels and demons. That's just what we call a literary device used in Scripture to make a point. There was an elderly woman in the front pew sitting next to a, a friend of hers and she leaned over and she said I wish one of those literary devices would come down and kick his butt <laughs> and he went on and he said we don't really believe in hell because after all a good God could never have a hell and he went on and on and on and he basically denied half the tenets of the faith now, this is the guy who's teaching. Finally, he finished, and he went down. Wouldn't you know it? He sat right in the front pew next to the old lady. <laughs> now, she had reached that age where she didn't care. <laughs> if you know what I mean. And she fidgeted about, and finally, she just couldn't stand it anymore, and she leaned over and whispered in his ear, Father, you don't believe in hell? He said, oh, no. He said, you'll believe it when you get there. <laughs> now, look, my point is not to dwell on those negative things. Suffice it to know that's real. It's very simple. You know, the way you learned to faith when you were a kid, it hasn't changed. It might seem like it's changed, but no. Externals can change. Discipline can change. But doctrine cannot and will not ever change. It's the truth. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is a God, there is a Satan, there is a heaven, there is a hell. There's a right way and a wrong way. There's light and darkness, truth and lies, good and evil. That's very simple, consummately simple. Let's not complicate a very, very simple thing. And our faith is simple because our faith concerns God. And God, by definition, theologically speaking, is pure simplicity. Mercy. God's very essence is mercy. God is mercy. Now, if that's true, and it is, I assure you, what about us? We are the single biggest obstacle to the salvation of souls that exist. Oh, yeah, the devil works, but you can't blame everything on the devil. We have a free will. And that's a powerful thing. You and I keep people out of the church. You know You know how? Oh, let me count the ways. We're bigoted. I remember when I was growing up, I played sports. You know, in that typical upstate New York town. There was one street where black people lived. And everybody thought they belonged there. I remember, now my father was not a prejudiced man. He was kind of unusual. Uh, he, he really wasn't. I never heard him say a bad word about someone's race. But let me tell you something. Catholics were just as bigoted 
Catholics were just as racially motivated as everybody else. You'd hear out of the mouths of Catholics, just as you would any pagan, the worst racial slurs. Wasn't any different. Do you know that the divorce rate among Catholics is the same as it is for the rest of the country? No different. Catholics are just as miserable as everybody else. Why on earth would anybody want to come into Catholic Church? You know, they take a look at some of us and say, hey, that's what it is? Ooh, no thanks. When they look at you, there should be something special. When they look at you, there should be something attractive about your life, a magnet. That's what I'm talking about. This Lent, I want you to try to allow the Holy Spirit to help you to be all you can be, like the Army commercial, you know, be all you can be. God wants great things from us. See, we're baptized into Christ. If you ever have an identity crisis, you've heard that term in psychology, sociology, identity crisis. We, we live in the era of the identity crisis. Hmm? Priests have had identity crisis. No, we don't know who we are. We don't know the meaning, the, the relevance of our life. Religious have had, rele have had those identity crises. Well, what's, you know, religious sisters very often. I came in and our beautiful sisters in the back when I passed them. Uh, in an instant, I, I remembered my, my life when I was young. How the church was enriched by these beautiful religious sisters who give their life to Jesus their spouse, and who did great work, and still do great work in the church. But often, and I don't blame them, and I don't blame the priests that have had it, but, you know, identity crisis. We wonder, you know, the world changes. I'm, you know, what, am I worth anything anymore? Is my vo vocation relevant? What is this? We have a crisis of identity. Married people. Well, I don't, you know, this marriage. I don't know. We, we change. We've grown apart. You're not the same person I married. I hope not. You're 50 years old. Well, you're the same person. <laughs> you're the same person. But, you know, d different, you know, certain things do change. And it's hard. We have to adapt. But that identity crisis, if you ever have an identity crisis and you're not quite sure where you came from or where you're headed or even where you are right now, you know what that's called? That's a description of being lost. Someone who has an identity crisis is lost. Now, that's not a curse. I'm not saying that in a derogatory manner. I've had it myself. I, you know, I used to, when I was a kid growing up, and I still do it, I like the outdoors. I was an absolute fanatic fisherman, hunter, always in the woods, always out on some lake or river fishing, and I still do it when I can. But you ever, you ever get lost in the woods? When I was a kid, Every now and then, I, I love to hunt somewhere. I'd be out in the woods, you know, and, and dusk would be coming and start get dark in the woods. And maybe you get turned around a little bit and every, every tree starts to look the same. You know, of course, I was never, being a great woodsman, I was never lost, just temporarily confused, <laughs> as Daniel Boone once said. But we don't know where we came from. Look, we came from God, right? Simple. We came from God. He's the creator. Where are we headed? We're headed back to God. Where are we right now? We should be in God. You want to know your identity, priest, religious, lay people, whether married or single. I'm going to, I, and I can do it wonderfully here in this beautiful church. I always like it when I have these, these helpers. Look up here. Look at this magnificent, very large crucifix. That's your identity. Take a good long look at it. Meditate on it for the rest of your life. That is your identity. And if you try to go anyplace else, you're going the wrong way. Now, does that frighten you? Yeah, me too. Does that make you nervous? Me too. But you know what? You can't get out of it. And neither can I. Jesus was born to die. We're born to die. But we're baptized in him. And so we can live in him. We can suffer in him. We can die in him. And you know what? You die with him, you're going to rise with him. 
And if you rise with him, you're going to reign with him forever. That's very simple. That's absolute simple teaching. I know you can do that. You can get that. That's the point of your life. Anything that is taking you away from that, get rid of it. It's garbage. Your job is to get to heaven. My job is to get to heaven. Love is a word that's used quite frequently and loosely today. In the church, we have all kinds of sermons on love. Most people don't have a clue what love is. Every once in a while in traveling, a good pastor will say, you know, I've got a couple getting married. They're doing the pre-cana counseling now. You know, I, I, I really, I'm not reaching them. Maybe you can help me while you're here. Would you talk to them? And I said, well, okay. I don't know what good it will do, but I'll, I'll try. Normally, I can't do things anywhere near as well as the parish priest can because they have a very special gift. They have a very special ministry. They're called to that, and they're given the gifts to do it. I have a gift for doing what I do, but I don't have a lot of the gifts that your parish priest would have. So anyway, on the appointed night of the pre cana conference, the young couple, come, they come in. You know, Instead of the benevolent, happy, smiling face of the pastor, they see me. <laughs> the grand inquisitor. And I said, so, you're going to be getting married. Oh, that's wonderful. You must be in love. Oh, well, yeah, Father, sir. We're in love. That's, that's why we're getting married, you know. Wonderful. Catholics, getting married. Experts on love. Could you please tell me what is love? Well, you know, Father, now this, this is in New York, okay? We're doing this in New York. Well, you know, Father, love. Hey, Father, we got feelings. <laughs> You know, we got, we got feelings. Hey, if all you got is feelings, man, feelings are up one day and down the next. You'd be like a yo-yo and the devil's pulling the string. Feelings? You better have more than feelings. What else? And the blushing bride-to-be mind to say, oh, oh, you know, Father, we have chemistry. Man, that could blow up. You better have more than chemistry. Come on, what's love? Come on, you experts on love. And they, they almost never get it. So I help them. How about this? If you love somebody, you desire the highest and best thing for that person. They can never argue with that. I mean, you could give other definitions that it'd be okay. There are other elements to it. But you have to accept that if you love somebody, you want the highest and best thing. You want the best for your wife, your husband. I said, yeah, okay, that's fine. Good. What's that? Well, um, how about a nice house? Some children? Good. You know, early retirement? Mm -hmm. A doggy named Spot? Mm -hmm. What else? What else? Well, come on, Father, what else, man? What else can there be? And then you give him the punchline. I do it like my grandmother used to do it. How about heaven? <laughs> How about heaven? If you desire the highest and best thing for the one you love, whoever that is, wife, husband, children, parents, pastor, congregation, if you desire, if you love someone, you desire the highest and best thing. And that's heaven. There is nothing higher and nothing better than eternal salvation. If I love you, and I do, if I love you, I want you in heaven forever. That's mercy. That's mercy. And I have to be willing to do anything and everything to get you there. You might not want to go. You may prefer to sin. You may prefer to live a very worldly and sinful existence. Hey, I sympathize with it. I did it for 20 years. I lived like an outright pagan. I should have known better. I was brought up Catholic. I had a good family. I, they made me, my mom, I was in church every Sunday. You better believe it. And there'd be, you know what to pay if I wasn't. It wasn't my family's fault. 
but I drifted away. Now, if I love you, I want you in heaven. You parents, you love your children, and sometimes they start to go off, you know, in, in the teenage years, you know, and you grandparents agonize over, oh, no, Johnny, Johnny's not going to church, you know? Oh, you know, Susie got tied up with that Harry Krishna guy, and, uh, you know, they're out selling flowers at the airport. <laughs> not good. You know, and you're doing novenas. Praying the rosy, lighting candles. Oh, my family lit candles. Man, we lit some candles. My family lit more candles. My grandparents should have bought stock in the candle company, because I'll tell you what. So you're doing all that. You, want, you, you know what's bad. You, you want your children, your grandchildren. You love them. Sure you do. And you want them to do the right thing. And you know that if they don't, they're not going to be happy. See, you have a certain wisdom. When you're younger, you don't have that wisdom. And, and any of us, at any age, have lapses of wisdom. I take this very seriously. You see, I was on the wrong side of the tracks for 20 years. I went the wrong way. I was the kid who grew up in the small town, good family, Catholic upbringing, back in the 50s and 60s. But you know how it was in the 60s? Remember, some of you are my age. You know, the, the age, our battle cry was, I gotta be free, I gotta be me. You know, we, some of us were at Woodstock. You know, some of you girls wore flowers in your hair. And you're so pretty. But then you went down the wrong way, you know? One thing leads to another, to another, to another. And before you know it, you got one foot in hell. And one foot on a banana peel. Not today we don't like to talk straight. We've turned into a very spineless, weak-kneed generation that can't countenance straight talk. But we need it. Like it or not. Make you uncomfortable, maybe you need to be uncomfortable. If you're living in sin, and I know that a lot of you aren't living in mortal sin, I'm not really talking to you, but I gotta talk to you who talk to others, right? We're, our, my job is to form the formators. You who are the heads of families. You who have the spiritual welfare of your children and grandchildren at heart. All of us are our brother's keeper. All of us have to care about the one and only thing that matters, getting heaven. Very simple. And how to do it. You have no mercy if you don't care. You're not like God if you're not merciful. Now how does the mercy manifest itself in so many ways? You've heard of the Spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty. Clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, comfort the imprisoned. Visit the sick, bury the dead. Now those corporal works of mercy, that's how we live out mercy. Now God's the one whose name is mercy. But we are called to make God present. Listen, no one's ever going to meet the living God unless they meet him through you. That's how they're going to encounter Christ, is through a Christian. It's hard sometimes. Now, do you look on certain classes of people with disdain? Do you despise them? How about homeless people? Well, they're no good, they don't work. They ought to get a job. They ought to do this. How about alcoholics and drug addicts? How about prostitutes? How about anybody that you think is less than you? I got news for you. You and I, and you and I are very alike. I, I, I can say this here around Buffalo because I honestly feel a closeness to you. We're, we're family, we're all family all over the world, of course, as humans and as Christians. But in a special way, you and I have more in common. So I, 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 I can say this to you in a very special, intimate way. You and I would be worse than the worst murderer, drug addict, prostitute, thief that ever lived except for the grace of God. You'd be in prison, and so would I, except for the grace of God. You'd be abusing children. So would I, except for the grace of God. And don't you forget it. You think you're hot stuff? Like my grandma used to say, you're too big for your britches. 
All of us. Me at the head of the list. St. Paul said that he felt that God had preserved him as an extreme example to show that mercies for everybody. I say that I relate to that passage from St. Paul so much. I really believe God preserved me as an extreme example to give witness to the whole world that, hey, if your sins are as scarlet, they can be made whiter than snow. No matter how bad your sin, God can forgive them in the twinkling of an eye. If only you'll go to them and ask him for forgiveness. That, that's called contrition. You know, we're sorry for our sins. We have a firm purpose of amendment. We can't guarantee anything, but we're sincere. We're going to do the best we can. And then you receive mercy. We've got to do it. The spiritual works of mercy. You know, admonish the sinner. That's a hard one. Instruct the uninformed. Lots of opportunity for that. Counsel the doubtful, a lot of people doubtful. Comfort the sorrowful. I've been a priest almost 10 years. I'm very, believe me, I'm very thankful for the priesthood. But it's killing me. I have seen so much sorrow in 10 years. Oh, I saw it in the, my life before. But I guess I never had the same eyes before. And my sensitivity to it, maybe it's a blessing, and yet it's a two-edged sword of a blessing because the other side of the sword, that sensitivity to suffering and pain, it hurts. I can't hardly stand to look at it anymore. I've seen some of the worst, you know, every place I go I see it, in one form or another. My husband just died from cancer, Father. He suffered for years. My wife is suffering with this. My children are in prison. I can only dimly imagine the pain that a parent can suffer for a child. My little sister was killed in a car accident when she was 14. Now, my mother suffered very much because of it, but I can't hardly imagine the depth of that pain. And I meet parents all over who suffer like that, spouses who suffer, priests who suffer. In the last several years, I've had many priests come to me, maybe because of certain notoriety I might have from television or whatever, I don't know why. But they'll come to me and, and I guess it's my testimony, they, they know that I kind of came up the rough way, that I had a rough life. And maybe they have a problem, you know, the, the priesthood's not easy. Nothing's easy. Not easy to be married, not easy to be a priest. I'm not saying it's any worse than what you have to suffer. But they'll come and they'll tell me about being rejected by their own brothers, by their bishop. They'll tell me about being marginalized, about being lonely and unhappy. Some of them start to drink. That's nothing new. Some of them even do drugs. Some of them get in trouble morally. I look at that whole, that ocean of sorrow. And my only response can be mercy. Can I judge them and say, oh, he should have been true to his vocation. She should have stayed in the convent. Visit. No, I can't do that. I feel pain for them. I wish good for them. I ask for God's mercy for them. Mercy is a godly thing. Can you be merciful? Can you feed the hungry? Do you know there are people hungry right in the streets of Buffalo? I myself was a homeless man. Sure, I grew up in that town in upstate New York. I followed the American dream. I caught it. I became very wealthy. Poor boy becomes rich boy. I did it on my own. I worked hard. 
multimillionaire. Then running with the fast lane set, movie stars, the rock stars, my clients, and my business in California and Los Angeles in the old days, 25 years ago. I became a drug addict, cocaine addict. $10,000 a week at times I spent back in the late 70s, early 80s. I've, ha I've even had people, you know, you know, one thing, every once in a while, it's funny how God works. Every once in a while, someone who's out of it will say, you know, that priest that's going around doing that, yeah. he's got a very bad past. You shouldn't let him come in there. You know what he did? And then someone said, Ten, millions of people know what he did. What the heck are you talking about? <laughs> See how God works? God can defuse a potential disaster. God brings good even out of evil. God doesn't will the evil. But God works all things for the good for those who love him. And even if you have bad things in your past, the mercy of God can transform them into good things. It's never too late. Never too late. Oh, yeah, I had every advantage and went the wrong way. I got no excuse. I was one of those who had been given much, didn't do much with it, squandered it. Like the prodigal son, you know, the parable in the Gospel of Luke. The prodigal son, he took his inheritance, ran off and squandered it, ended up destitute. Humbled himself, remember this. He came back and he humbled himself to his father. If you're a sinner, you need to be humble. There's nobody in here who isn't a sinner. And the ones who think they're so good, you might be worse than that criminal in prison. I don't know what he was given. Maybe he grew up in the inner city, never saw his father, his mama was on crack. Maybe he never had a chance. Maybe he never got a chance to go to church. Maybe he didn't have a good mother like I did, good grandma, grandfather, the rest of my relatives. Did everything to help me go the right way. Maybe he didn't have that. Maybe he's better than I am. Except for the grace of God, there go I. And, you know, that could be anything. Remember that. Whenever you're tempted to look down your nose at somebody, you remember that. Except for the grace of God, there go I. Jesus ran into the self-righteous Pharisees in his day who look down their noses at sinners. Oh, I'm glad I'm not like that man. Oh, no, I'm good. I fast. I tithe. I do this. I do that. See how good I am. A lot of Catholics like that. When I preached in my hometown, when I was first starting out on Sunday, there was a woman who'd call up my mother's house after the sermon every Sunday morning, and she'd complain. Now, I've been a Catholic 60 years. I don't need to hear that. I don't need some upstart like you telling me about sins and this and that. And she'd go on and on and on and on. She's the one who needed it. The guy who was in the back of the church, a homeless guy, would come in. And he was afraid to even come up in the front because he was homeless. He was an alcoholic. He had the same clothes on day in and day out. He was dirty. He'd sit in the back of the church and he'd cry. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And that arrogant woman who boasted of being a, quote, Catholic for so long, she was not justified. The poor man in the back who said, Lord, have mercy on him. He didn't even dare come up to the front. Why? He knew he was a sinner. Humility is the acknowledgement of truth. It's essential. God's mercy is there. Are you a dispenser, a conduit of mercy? Are you a conduit of mercy or an obstacle to mercy? When people come in contact with you, are you judgmental, bigoted, closed-minded, narrow, rigid, and so forth and so on? Or are you compassionate? Are you loving? Are you quick to show forth the mercy of God? Do you know what my name means, the Hebrew derivation of John? Yohanan. 
to show forth the mercy of God. That's what the name means. You know what the name Jesus means? Jesus. God who saves. Or Savior. Names were very important in antiquity. They made present, they manifested the one who carried the name. We all carry the name of God, Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. We are all Christians. How did God save? Through an act of mercy. His passion, death, and resurrection. Do we enter into that Paschal mystery, in fact, in our daily lives? Are you merciful? I remember when I was at my low point, I remember being in the streets, homeless, brokenhearted. I mean, I was in my middle 30s. I had risen from a poor boy in a modest beginning to become a wealthy, successful man, then lost it all through my own stupidity. You know, you could say, yeah, well, it's your own fault. I, I, yes, it was. It was my own fault, my own stupidity. Yes. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone, as Jesus said. I remember being at my low point, sitting in the park. Hadn't eaten for two or three days. Had no money. Clothes on my back and group of people came along and spit on me. It was prob I, I don't know, reducing a human being, treating them in a way that strips their dignity from them, makes them feel worse like that, that's a hellish thing to do. That's what Satan does. Oh, I don't want those Mexicans moving in here. The Puerto Rican, whatever. And that comes out of the mouths of a lot of Catholics. Oh, those black people cause all the trouble. Out of the mouths of so-called Christians and Catholics. You better not carry that sin to your grave, if you have that sin. Are you a fountain of mercy? Is God's mercy overflowing from you? I couldn't have been any further down than I was, other than being dead. I spent a year in a hospital, VA hospital, a VA psychiatric hospital. Not one person ever came to visit me, ever. I had hundreds of so-called friends and acquaintances. But when I went down, not a one. My mother is the only person that ever visited me. Visit the sick. Do you visit the sick? Those in nursing homes, your own parents sometimes. How many elderly people languish only rejected, they raise families, nobody even shows up. Works of mercy. God is merciful. How merciful was God? Let me tell you how merciful God was for me. You, you know, you don't really know me. A lot of you know my little story. But you don't know how really rotten I was. And I was. Bad. You name it. I did it. All ten, many times over, broke all the Ten Commandments. Twenty years I didn't set foot in a church. Drug addict. In the gutter. Literally, I'd wake up mornings, wouldn't even know where I was or what had happened. The filth, the scum of the earth. I believe our Lord one day looked down and saw that mess, and he turned to his mother and said, Would you look at that? You ever seen anything so bad? And he said, Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go down and take a closer look at this. And I can well imagine our lady looking at me like a mother would look at a, a little child who fell in a pig trough or something, you know. Ah, what a mess. 
And you know what mothers do, they clean up their children. So she took me and she bathed me in the blood of her son, washing my sins away. Oh, I ended up going to confession, all right. Went to Orysville, you know, the shrine of the North American martyr. I remember coming home after having been homeless and in pain and suffering for years. Went to my mother's house. Now, going to my mother's house was quite an interesting thing. Now, you have to understand, my mother, having come from a family of very Catholic people, my mother was Italian, but she also has some French, French-Canadian. My mother's father was French-Canadian. We are a very Catholic family, both sides. And in my mother's little house, little house I grew up in, there, it was like a religious goods store. <laughs> there were more crucifixes, statues of the Blessed Mother, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, Bibles, rosaries. My mother went and got holy water by the five-gallon jug. <laughs> now, that's where I went, and I was a mess when I, I went there. I could imagine the devil would have taken... He took a horrible beating in that house. <laughs> Now, he come in there to try to torment me, but I'll tell you what, he got the snot beat out of him in that house. <laughs> Man, there was holy water everywhere. And, and I, I didn't understand. And then, my, my, you know, when I first went home, my mother was always going through the, through the house, <laughs> mumbling prayers that I should probably do in exorcism prayers or something. <laughs> I started to read the Bible, I started to say the rosary, went to confession at Orysville. Seven years later, I was ordained by the Pope. Three years later, my dad came to hear me preach. My dad, who has a very important part in my ministry. One day, my dad said, I wish I could have been a better father. God heard the prayer. My father's had three open-heart surgeries. He was a tough guy. My father was a typical macho Italian tough guy, athlete, great athlete, boxer, played all sports. He also played the horses <laughs> too much, drank. You know, he's a wild guy. Not good. And he said to me, I wish I could have been a better father. God heard the prayer. He's had 37 surgeries. The man has been in pain nonstop for years. He helps breathe power into my ministry and my mother, too, in her way. Mercy. Do you understand that God's mercy is infinite and that you and I are called to be fountains, conduits, and dispensers of mercy? Well, my dad came to hear me preach. And at the end, when he had to leave, he said, you got a minute for me? I said, well, sure, Dad, because you know when I'm ministering, I'm really besieged. I don't have a minute for hardly anything. And I said, well, sure, Dad. And he said, you know what? He says, I'd like to go to confession. And I heard these words come out of my father's mouth. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's 50 years since my last confession. He made a beautiful confession. He went on to do his part, I went on to do my part, and my part concerns mercy. And your part concerns mercy. This land, as we're preparing for the coming, or rather for the resurrection of the Lord, for his passion, death, and resurrection, during Lent, as we're preparing, concentrate on mercy. And that means be merciful. Be merciful. Be merciful to that relative you just can't stand. Be merciful to your children who seem to be going the wrong way. That doesn't mean you have to accept sin. You don't have to accept evil. But be kind, gentle, and be merciful. How often, when Peter asked Jesus, how often must I forgive those who sin against me? Seven times, Lord. Oh, no, I tell you, not seven times, 70 times seven. That means an infinite number. Now, God practices what he preaches. As often as we go to him, repentant, he will forgive us. What about us? 
Are we the same way? Or do we get sick and tired of certain people, certain classes of people? My dear friends, mercy. Be merciful as God is merciful to us. And remember, please remember, God's mercy is for everyone. God's mercy is infinite. And God's mercy endures forever. God bless you.